Thank you very much. Um, good morning, uh, everybody. Thank you very much to the uh, organizers for the opportunity to uh, present some of the uh, work that we've been uh, doing and using Blender uh, as, a, a, as a tool for our analysis of, uh, of electron microscopy images. Just to, uh, as an introduction of who I am, um, I'm Graham Knott from the EPFL, and I head the uh, facility of uh, electron microscopy for the life science faculty, and I have a particular research interest in uh, exploring the ultrastructure of the brain. And it's important uh, at this point to actually mention that I am uh, somewhat of a fraud because, of course, I'm not Francesca, who was in this uh, slot before. But also, uh, I'm very, in many ways, a very new to Blender. I've known Blender for many, many years, but I'm really very, very new uh, to uh, all its, its capabilities. Uh, but I've known the possibilities that it has. So it's important for us, I think, to communicate what we do with Blender, uh, but also in the reverse sense of what the Blender community can actually get and see the opportunities it has an as an analysis tool in certain scientific projects. And I'll mention something about that a little bit later. <clears throat> so just to um, sh uh, explain who the characters are involved in this, um, I'm not a computer person, but I work, um, collaborate very heavily with computer vision scientists. Um, so involved in this project is Jan Jorstadt from the lab of uh, Pascal Fuhr at the EPFL. Uh, and there's also input from uh, people in the lab, Corrado Carli and also uh, Marta Vavrizniak. Uh, and also, um, uh, Biagio Negro here will present uh, some of what he's done in, in, in Blender, because he's been doing a lion's share of the, uh, uh, the scripting and programming. So just to get us onto, the, uh, onto the, 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 the same page, if you like, of understanding what we're doing, uh, is a very brief anatomy lesson. And we'll start off with an image of the brain, <clears throat> the human brain. And it's about one, one and a half liters of this very, very soft tissue. And we know that within this brain, now if I showed you a mouse brain, a mouse brain is just much, much smaller. But essentially, it's exactly the same. There's the same circuits. There is the same morphology. It's just through some quirk of evolution, the human brain has become massive. And we see on the surface of the brain these folds. It's become so big that it has to fold itself up to actually sit inside the cranium. But essentially, if we look at any brain, uh, fly brain, worm brain, uh, worm nervous system, uh, what we have is we have neurons that interconnect. So here in the very simplest sense, we have two neurons, we have a cell body, and we have these protrusions, these dendrites and axons, and the axons will communicate from one neuron to the next with, through these synaptic connections. So we have an axon that's the transmitter, and on the receiving side, we have the dendrites that are the receivers. The problem is, if we want to really truly understand the entire brain, we need to understand the entire circuitry. And if we think about the human brain, we have about 80 billion neurons. And if we take a single microliter, a cubic millimeter of brain tissue, we have about a billion synaptic connections and about four kilometers of transmitting fibers, so these axons. So we can do an awful lot with light microscopy in understanding where different neurons sit in different layers of the cortex and how they're arranged differently in different parts of the cortex and different parts of the brain. But if we want to really understand the full detail of who's connected to, to who and how they're connected, we need to focus down on very small parts and we would like to build obviously some sort of circuit diagrams. Now, because of the human's insatiable appetite to understand the details of how, thing work, how things work and how things are put together and to model them. There are some, you may have seen them in the popular press recently, uh, there are these uh, very, very heavily funded projects that have been started, initiated recently. There's the uh, European, a billion euro project that's um, centered at the EPFL in Switzerland, which is the Human Brain Project, which plans to model uh, the human brain in a supercomputer. There's the Brain Project, Obama's, um, <coughs> President Obama's Brain Project, which is the acronym is uh, for Brain Research Through uh, Advanced Innovative Neurotechnologies. And there's the Allen Brain Institute uh, in Chicago, funded by Paul Allen, one of the founders of Microsoft, who has the, um, the, the, the Allen Brain Project, which is a massive database of information that can be used in a collaborative sense with these projects. So there's extraordinary levels of funding for these types of modeling studies. Now, of course, go back to what we we're talking about. We're talking about uh, the, the, the connectivity between neurons. And here we have light microscopy. And really, if we push light microscopy to its limits, unusual and normal transmitted light micrograph, uh, this lower panel, we see a dendrite and we see little bumps along the dendrite. 
So we can infer there's possibly synaptic connections. But if we take one of those little bumps and use an electron microscope, uh, we can see, sorry, there's no, is there a pointer? No. So we can see a, uh, on, on the left-hand side, we can see there's a, uh, a dendrite um, which has been sectioned. On the right, uh, on the, sorry, on the left-hand side, we see a, uh, these small spheres. These are neurotransmitters uh, which are communicating with a, 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 through a synapse. So this field of view is only about uh, two microns, and we can start to appreciate that we see an awful lot with electron microscopes. But we're using a special type of scanning electron microscope, the sort of microscope that can generate pictures like this. Uh, incidentally, I, there's, I, I've, when I started with Blender, I, I saw there were some tutorials for simulating how you get an electron micro scanning electron microscopy image. Sort of, sort of tutorials are incredibly uh, useful for teaching students in electron microscopy how you generate different types of images. Um, so we use a, a type of scanning electron microscope which is able to actually remove the surface of a sample of brain, only a few nanometers. Then it's able to scan the surface and generate an image, then remove again a bit of the surface and then take another image. So we get these serial images through our sample and here we're looking at uh, serial images through the uh, region of the brain using this what is we call focused ion beam scanning electron microscopy. So we get this uh, very high resolution stack of images. Now this type of imaging uh, has now uh, initiated a number of projects. Um, so here we have a, a, a stack of these images. Um, and we just, this is just a, a movie in Blender just to actually show that we can actually set up these arbitrary slice planes uh, through these stack of images to see the structure in, in optimal resolution. So we can really understand the full structural detail of what is in the brain. And what, of course, we want to do is we want to be able to analyze the stack, this block of images on the left-hand side, uh, and actually be able to put it into a model on the right-hand side. So on the left, we have a, the, the, the cube is about 10 microns by 10 microns by 10 microns. And on the right-hand side, we have uh, essentially a model of the full thickness of the, uh, of the cerebral cortex. Uh, so that's about a millimeter in thickness. So we can see we have a lot of data to actually put in. Now, the way we started off by doing this analysis, not very many years ago, uh, before we had all this ability to look at things in 3D, of course, we were using sort of segmentation procedures where we, we, we by hand, we would color in the features. So here we've colored in a, a dendrite, this large structure at the bottom that's transversely sectioned, and we see the long, thin, green process that goes up towards the synaptic contact. Um, a very long, laborious process, but of course, we're dealing with three-dimensional images, and to do this by hand for such massive data sets is simply impossible. So we have these collaborations with labs like the uh, lab of um, sorry, I don't know what happened there. So we have this uh, with this, this lab in uh, of, uh, of Fred Hambrecht who has a piece of software, open source software. This is uh, Elastic, um, so we can uh, download this software and it allows us to um, upload our images into the uh, into the software and actually select on the, on the left hand side. We can select with the uh, with the mouse. Uh, some of these uh, features. And then very rapidly, uh, using an advanced watershed algorithm, the program is able to give us a 3D model of the structure that we want. So doing this by hand uh, just only a few years ago would have taken us many days uh, and even weeks to actually segment a few structures on a very, very limited data set. But with this type of uh, these algorithms now, we can do this very, very rapidly. Um, so here is a dendrite on the right-hand side, this red dendrite, and you can see these, uh, what we call the dendritic spines, these processes that come off it that form these synaptic connections. So just a few images of the, uh, sort of the workflow we can scribble down on the, uh, using a pencil tool to select the different features. Um, it will then, the program will automatically have this advanced watershed technique and then give us a, a, a 3D model. So it allows us to interact with this volume. But of course, then there's another uh, refinement of this program that allows us to pick out automatically the synaptic connections, so the arbitrarily colored the synaptic connections. Uh, and there's also with Pascal Fuhr's group in the um, EPFL, he has an algorithm now that allows us to image uh, the, the, the series of it and then pick out automatically the mitochondria here in red. So these are the structures involved in uh, producing energy. Uh, uh, there's a lot of research, intense research focus on these structures implicated in uh, malformations of these implicated in some of the neurodegenerative diseases. We want to get data about them from different regions of the brain. 
And there lies the problem, because the computer vision scientists now are able to give us these models um, using these algorithms very, very quickly. But for us as biologists, there is no information of this. The, the computer vision person doesn't care how big they are. These could be a kilometer wide. These could be a micron wide. They don't care. So now we need to be able to analyze them, interact with them, and actually get data out of this. Uh, and that's why we've turned to, to Blender, because really there are no tools out there. Uh, there are some pieces of software that people that these labs do invest in, but they invest very heavily in these pieces of software. But the uh, amount of analysis we can do is very, very limited. And so that's why we've turned to Blender in, the, uh, in this open source uh, approach. And really the, um, the opportunity now is that we can import these models into Blender and start to interact with the 3D model. Rather than interacting with the serial images, which is a long, slow process, we can just now interact with the 3D models and start to uh, select different regions. Because by selecting different regions, for example, some of the protrusions, the dendritic spines, for example, we can immediately understand volume, surface areas, length, and understand how these change from different brain regions in different layers and in different states, for example, when a brain ages. But of course, what we're importing is these huge, um, huge data sets. Uh, and just to give you an appreciation of, of, of the sort of complexity, this is uh, uh, all the elements that are in a single uh, five by five by five micron cube of brain tissue, adult brain tissue, all the different elements that are there. This is pieces of axon, pieces of dendrite, and some of the supporting cells. Uh, in the middle, you see the, uh, the, 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 the synapses. And you can see how tightly they're packed together and how complex this is. So this was a, a movie that was actually made in Blender uh, by Turbin Kroger in uh, Fred Hambrecht's group in Heidelberg um, of data that was acquired uh, by Natalia Korogod in the lab. So at that point, I'd like to then actually pass over to uh, Biagio, who will just go through what he's actually implemented in Blender in allowing us to now actually get some, some, some real numbers and real data uh, using Blender. Biagio. So, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Biagio, I'm the, the developer of the software uh, together with Anne Jorstad, uh, also from uh, EPFL. Uh, so basically, I want to give you a um, uh, practical uh, demonstration. Sorry, we don't know. Okay. No? Perhaps you could help. I'm not sure what the... Suddenly it's gone. Uh, where's your video partner? Yeah, okay, there's no more. I'm not sure if you had a hot key or something. Hmm. Nothing. Yeah, so something refreshed. Something, something with the connection, I think. Something with the connection. Something with the connection, definitely. I would maybe take this away. Okay, it's something maybe here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Take this out. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it suddenly, it suddenly went. It went yeah. Okay. There Change the connector. Okay. There you go. Yes. Uh, that, that connector is probably because of You have a back on? Yeah, yeah I put like mine in. Okay. Can you see now? Yeah, you changed it and it's working now. Mirror them. 
kalau LCD.